Hello, and welcome to a historical tour of the Southern Methodist University, otherwise known as SMU. Dr. Stuart Heidler conceived of the idea to build a great university in Dallas in 1911, the year the university was officially founded. He based the university's architectural layout on the University of Virginia. And if you've ever been to UVA, the similarities are unmistakable. Especially prominent is Dallas Hall, the campus's main building and visible here in the distance. Heiler named the building Dallas Hall in recognition of the importance of the city to the university and the financial commitment it had made. A group of Dallas citizens, Heiler himself, and other local organizations initially granted the university $200,000. The university itself, however, did not open its doors to students until 1915. Its first year, SMU saw 706 students enroll, the second largest public initial enrollment at the time. Only the University of Chicago had more. The original campus was a 100-acre gift, also from the city of Dallas. SMU quickly acquired other lands, but several key tracks were sold off during the Depression so that the university could continue to function. Heiler served as the university's first president, though he continued to teach the entire time, teaching all the university's courses in physics. It's somewhat interesting that the first leader of the Southern Methodist University was not a theologian, but a scientist. In his first few years, SMU and Heiler had to work on their big dreams with very little money. He wanted a university on par with Stanford, and the University of Chicago, despite the fact that Stanford had an initial endowment of 20 million, Chicago 30, while in the end, SMU raised barely $1 million. Still, SMU got enough support from the Greater Methodist Church and from the local people of Dallas that it was able to operate in the green until the throes of the Great Depression. Heiler, in a nod to his ambition, selected Harvard Crimson and Yale Blue as the school colors in order to associate SMU with the high standards of Ivy League universities. Heiler resigned the post of president in 1919, desperate to spend more time in the lab. He did so, continuing to research and teach at SMU until his death in 1929. In 2005, the university's endowment passed $5 billion for the first time. On February the 22nd, 2008, the university trustees unanimously instructed President R. Gerald Turner to enter into an agreement to establish the George W. Bush Presidential Center on 23 acres on the southeast side of the campus. The center, which includes a presidential library, museum, institute, and the offices of the George W. Bush Foundation was dedicated on April the 25th, 2013, in a ceremony which featured all former living U.S. presidents, Jimmy Carter, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and then incumbent President Barack Obama. The library and museum are privately administered by the National Archives and Records Administration, while the university holds representation on the Independent Public Policy Board. The project raised over $500 million for the construction and endowment 
of the George W. Bush Presidential Center, which has a 249-year ground lease from SMU with extensions and operates separately from SMU. As of the fall of 2020, the university itself had 12,373 students, including 6,827 undergraduates and 5,546 postgraduates, the largest student body in SMU history. During the mid-20-teens, in light of turmoil within the Methodist Church over what the university described as fundamental differences over LGBTQ policies, the university decided to separate itself from control of the church. In November 2019, the SMU board filed with the state of Texas amended articles of incorporation that eliminated the United Methodist Church's rights as listed in the 1996 articles. The amendment made it clear that SMU is solely maintained and controlled by its board as the ultimate authority for the university and removed an overarching statement that the school would be, quote, owned, maintained, and controlled by the Southern Central Jurisdictional Conference of the Church, unquote. Within a month, the church filed a lawsuit alleging the trustees of SMU to have no authority to amend the Articles of Incorporation without the prior approval and authorization of the organization. But in March of 2021, a Dallas County judge ruled in favor of SMU in the lawsuit. Of course, what SMU is most notorious for is being the only victim of the NCAA's so-called death penalty, issued against the school in 1987. In the 1970s, the northern Texas city of Dallas was a growing metropolis and a hub for businessmen who had recently acquired their fortunes thanks to oil and real estate. Virtually to a man... Each person had a college football team that he supported. And with that support, as it always does, came an intense sense of pride and competition. Lots of competition. If you combine that environment with the enormous success of the NFL's Dallas Cowboys during the 70s, it's easy to see how much pressure all of a sudden was placed on the main university in Dallas, SMU. When Ron Meyer, the former coach of the undefeated UNLV football program, was hired as the SMU head coach in 1976, well, it seemed like SMU was destined for greatness. And at first, everything worked fine. Now, by all accounts, virtually every major program in the Southwestern Conference was bribing players to attend their colleges in the late 1970s and early 1980s. The change came in the form of running back Eric Dickerson. Dickerson was one of the nation's top prospects. A high school running back so gifted, I mean, he could have chosen any school in the country in 1979. By all accounts, SMU wasn't even in the running. Sure, I mean, they'd come a long way towards some respectability since Meyer got there. But, I mean, they weren't on a level with a school like Oklahoma, USC, and certainly not Notre Dame. Plus, Dickerson had already committed to Texas A&M. And, famously, had already received a Pontiac Trans M that SMU supporters had dubbed the Trans A&M right around that time. Then, suddenly, and mysteriously, Dickerson had a change of heart. He decommitted from A&M and picked SMU shortly thereafter. Dickerson changed everything for the Mustangs. With him powering the offense, the team became a force to be reckoned with. 
but there were always major questions as to why Dickerson had suddenly changed course. And the greater success of the SMU football program brought with it greater scrutiny. SMU was in a difficult position because Dallas had a vibrant and competitive sports media scene led by the Dallas Morning News and the Dallas Times Herald at the time, and one that was increasingly focused on investigative journalism in the wake of Watergate. By 1982, when Bobby Collins took over for Meyer, who left for the NFL, and led SMU to its sole undefeated season, all eyes were on the Mustangs. The tide began to turn permanently when SMU recruited Sean Stopperich, a prep star from Pittsburgh. Stopperich was paid $5,000 to commit to the university and move his family to Texas. But SMU did not understand or know that his career as a useful football player was already over. He was an offensive lineman, but he blew out his knee in high school and ultimately left the university after just one year, barely even getting on the field. Upon his departure from SMU, Stopperich became the first key witness for the NCAA in its pursuit of the university. It didn't go straight to the death penalty. At first, the NCAA put a round of penalties down on SMU in 1985, banning the school from bowl games for two seasons and stripping away 45 scholarships over a two-year period. At the time, those were considered some of the harshest sanctions in NCAA history. In response, Bill Clements, the chairman of the Board of Governors for SMU, just hung a group of the school boosters who were dubbed the Naughty Nine out to dry and just kind of blaming them as scapegoats for everything that had gone wrong. Shortly thereafter, again, because of a lot of cheating going on at a lot of universities, I don't want to throw SMU under the bus here, the NCAA convened a special meeting to discuss new harsher rules for cheating, the most severe of which was the death penalty. Said death penalty would cancel an entire season for any program, effectively destroying its ability to recruit new players and coaches. Now, if SMU had cut off its payment to players immediately, the story probably ends there. But it didn't. Instead, 